My name is Teresa Schmeikalova and I will be guiding you through this webinar. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, so we will be looking at monitoring glacier velocity with Sentinel-1 uh, using offset tracking and we will be looking at the Peterman Glacier in northwestern Greenland. Um, so let me first just say a few words um, regarding the outline of this webinar. Uh, if you have attended previous webinar, you, webinars, you know how this goes. So first I will say a um, few words uh, on uh, Rus Copernicus. Um, if you're already familiar with it, we apologize, but this is also for the benefit of the new users or new, new people uh, listening to the webinar. And then I will briefly introduce the study area, um, then Sentinel-1A, which we will be using for the exercise, and then we will move on to the exercise, and finally to a Q&A session. Uh, this all should take approximately hour to one and a half hours, uh, depending uh, on the Q&A session. Uh, I would uh, encourage you to submit any questions that you might have during the webinar uh, using the question um, form uh, you have in your GoToWebinar panel. Uh, this is due to the fact that we are usually quite a lot of people, so if everybody starts to post their questions during the Q&A session, it might happen that we will not have time to answer all. So in this case, we will try to answer questions as they come during the exercise as well. So first, as I said, I will introduce briefly the research. Um, it stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products, and it's an initiative that's um, managed by the Euro uh, sorry funded by the European Commission and fund uh, and managed by the European Space Agency. Uh, its main goal is to provide free and open, scalable platforms uh, in the form of virtual machines um, to users who wish to. Um, exploit the Sentinel data for research purposes or just to learn how to use the data um, for R&D and so on. So the RUS environments generally come in the form of virtual machines that you will see today because I will be using it for the exercise. They are pre-installed with a suite of uh, open source toolboxes such as SNAP, QGIS, BRAD um, and many others as well as development environments such as Python, um, Eclipse, R and so on. Um, Apart from the fact that we provide the virtual machines, we also provide um, specialized, remote, specialized remote sensing help desks. So if during your processing uh, you have any issues uh, with processing of the data, you don't know which data to use and so on and so on, um, there is the remote sensing help desk. Again, this service is free from the European Commission and ESA. Uh, and you can ask us and we can um, advise you how to proceed. So um, apart from the specialized remote sensing desk, the uh, help desk, and also the, the virtual machines. We also use the virtual machines to provide uh, training activities such as webinars and face-to-face -face events. So we organize webinars such, webinars such as this one approximately once a month. Um, we always advise, uh, um, announce it about two weeks in advance. You can find it on our webpage. You can also find it on our Twitter account and uh, Facebook and so on. Um, I'll show you uh, the Rus web page a little bit later. And then we also have a face-to-face -face events, which we again also uh, announce on the, on the web page. Either they are uh, as a part of conferences or they are standalone events for up to two days, and they include usually theory and practical exercises with um, the virtual machines. So here we can see the web pages. Um, so the first one is the one where you can request a virtual machine and the second one is the training web page. So now let me just go to the web pages quickly and show you. So first uh, let's have a look at the Bruce uh, portal web page uh, where you can apply and register where you can register and apply for a virtual machine if you are interested in it. You can also, for example, all this this, this webinar is available on, as a training kit on the virtual machines. So if you wish to repeat the webinar, you, I will give you a code at the end of the exercise, and you can use this code to request the virtual machine with the specific training kit in order to step, repeat this webinar. You also get a step-by-step -step guide um, included in the training kit, so uh, you can use that to practice uh, this webinar and many others. So just to uh, show quickly here, you can see, uh, you can read more about what RUS is, what is its purpose and main aim and so on. Here you can uh, read more about the offer. Um, as I said before, all uh, that RUS offers is always free. And here you can hear, see more about the computing environments, um, the software that's uh, installed by default on the virtual machines. 
and some limitations that apply to the duration and processor number and disk space and so on that we have. Um, and here you can also find other um, resources to learn by yourself and so on. And uh, here you can register, you can create your account and then you can proceed to uh, log in once you do that. So I will not go through the steps but I will need to log in in order to open my virtual machine on which I will run this training. So just give me a second. Very well, and once you have your account and you log in, you have this new web page where you can see your profile, dashboard, and training. So, and you can, from your dashboard, you can request a new user service uh, or virtual machine. And you see, can see that I already requested mine and I have one here. And from here, you can access it, request a webinar kit to be uploaded, and many other things. Get support from our your help desk. You can also chat with the support desk and so on. Okay, so now let's just quickly introduce also the second web page that you've probably already seen because you, that's where you have registered for this webinar. So uh, this is our Roost training web page. Um, if you go to the trainings, you can see the upcoming trainings uh, in which I believe at the moment we have one event which is a face-to-face -face event um, for December uh, that is uh, taking place in Denmark. Unfortunately, this one is already fully um, occupied, or there is no more free spaces, but uh, there will be new trainings up, uh, upcoming soon. So you can see them here on this web page. And then you can go to the past sessions. And if it is a webinar, you can see, for example, this was the last webinar that we have. Um, it's here, that was the one from um, October. And you can also find the recording of the webinar. So the entire webinar is recorded and you can replay it here on the web page or on our YouTube channel, and you can also see the Q&A session, um, sort of a summary of the Q&A session, because that one is not recorded uh, on the video, um, so you can um, get all the information that's provided during the workshop as well. So you can also have, have a look at our um, e-learning and some news and so on. So now let's go back to the presentation, just very quickly. Um, so I was mentioning our YouTube page. So this is our YouTube channel. It's called Rusko Pernikus Training. You can also find all the recorded webinars here on this web page. Um, this is sort of uh, outdated screenshot, so there is many more now available. You can also find three more videos that are regarding to how, do, how to download Sentinel data, how to request a Rus virtual machine, and how to register for Rusko Pernikus um, and other information. So now this was just a short intro to Rus, and let's move on to explanation or short description of our study area. So today, as I said, we will be looking at a Peterman Glacier in the northwest Greenland. Um, we can see it here on the map. Uh, it's a large marine terminating glacier, uh, and it's one of the largest remaining floating ice shelves uh, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it had approximately 70 kilometers of ice shelf, or floating ice tongue, uh, and it, had, it has undergone quite rapid changes in the last approximately 10 years. So in 2010, in August 2010, um, approximately one quarter of the floating ice shelf, or about 260 kilometers square, broke off. We can see that here. And then um, another event occurred in uh, July 2012 when approximately 130 kilometers squared, which is roughly twice the size of Manhattan, again tore off of the tongue, reducing the size quite significantly. So we will, to monitor the velocity of the, of the glacier and how fast it moves, we will be um, using Sentinel-1. And just a few words about the Sentinel-1 mission. Uh, the mission comprises of two um, of twin polar satellites that are in the same orbit, faced approximately 180 degrees to each other. They're called Sentinel-1A uh, and Sentinel-1B. And they carry an uh, active sensor uh, in C-band uh, with a wavelength corresponding to approximately 5.4 uh, centimeters. The short, uh, it has very short revisit uh, time, approximately one day or less uh, in the high um, latitudes. And the repeat time, which is meaning that the satellite is acquiring from the exactly same orbit at the exactly the same geometry, is six days. And it provides all weather and date acquisitions um, because it's an active sensor, as I said before. And it provides four different imaging modes. Actually, on the video that you see on the 
right side of the screen. It shows um, the pass um, in uh, interferometric white swath over the Peterman Glacier, which is exactly what we will be using for this training. So, all right, so this is the last slide that I have, and now let's move towards uh, the exercise. So I will go back to the web page and I will access my virtual machine from my dashboard. Okay. So this is how uh, our virtual machines look. It's basically a remote desktop that you can access via your internet browser. Um, so the only prerequisite really to use this machine is a reasonable uh, internet connection. And it's already pre-installed with, uh, with a lot of software, but you can also install, install any software that you wish, provided you have a valid license or it's open source software. Uh, there is some limitations to the proprietary software that can be installed on this machine, which are given uh, by security measures and so on. But uh, if you uh, are a user, of course, and you have any specific questions, you can always ask us. So today we will be using SNAP, which I will open here. And SNAP is uh, called Sentinel's Application Platform. And it's a software which is specifically developed by ESA to um, process um, ESA satellite data, in this case Sentinel data, and it contains three two boxes which are uh, dedicated to Sentinel-1, 2, and 3. We will today be using mostly Sentinel-1, 2 box, of course, since that's the data that we will be using for our exercise. Um, if you are familiar with SNAP, um, then you um, this is, will not be any surprise for you. If you're not, I will just shortly introduce. So there is a product explorer where all the loaded products uh, you can see. And down here you have uh, quite useful things such as navigation, which shows you where is the view located on the full image, uh, the view that you have open. Uh, and then there is a world map, which shows you the location of your uh, acquisition that you have open, and color manipulation, for example. So let's open some images to see how it looks in, uh, in practice. So today we will be using two images. Uh, from the 9th and 21st of September 2017, uh, which were acquired over the glacier. So now if I go to the world map, I can see the location of my two images. You can note that they are 12 days apart, which means uh, they are acquired in the same ge exact same geometry by a same platform. So they are both acquired by Sentinel-1A. If I wanted a shorter um, time between, I would use the Sentinel-1B acquisition, which is six days apart, which is very valuable, especially for um, fast-moving, uh, very fast-moving glaciers, although, uh, or very fast-moving phenomena, let's say. Okay, so these are our two images. They are both acquired in the interferometric white swath, and they are both a ground range detected products, which is a level one uh, product that's produced by ESA and available globally. And um, this one contains four bands. Um, it contains amplitude bands uh, in HH and HV polarization and intensity bands in the same. Intensity is derived from the amplitude, so that's why it's only uh, saved here as a virtual band. It's not physically saved. It's calculated on the fly. And you can see the two polarizations, so it's dual polar, uh, dual pole um, acquisition. So let's open the intensity HH. Then just to have a quick look at the image. This might take a little while because uh, while my machine is actually very strong, it has 32 gigabytes of RAM, uh, the image is uh, rather large, so um, it might take a little while to open. So there we go. Um, so this is our full Sentinel-1 acquisition in the interferometric white swath. Uh, this bright area, a brighter area here, corresponds to the ice sheet. Uh, green and ice sheet, and here we have the Naris Strait, and here uh, we have the tongue of the of the glacier, and then um, also the water surface. And then these parts here correspond to the um, to the bare rock. So if you look actually at this uh, image here, and you look at this image here, you can see that they, it appears to be flipped um, horizontally or mirrored horizontally. And this is due to the fact that the scene was acquired during a descending pass. Uh, meaning that it was moving from north to south, and the satellite is always looking right, which means that the first pixel that was acquired was right here, and the satellite always, or sorry, the, the SNAP software, uh, because this 
image is still in the radar geometry, uh, the SNAP software always uh, displays the image uh, with the first acquired pixel, you could say, in the upper left corner, which means that this is because this was the first one that was acquired. It was sort of the image appears flipped and you have the first acquired pixel in the upper left corner here. We will fix, fix this uh, in the next steps. So now let's move into the processing part. So we need to apply identical pre-processing steps to uh, both of our scenes. There's quite a number of steps that you need to perform on uh, Sentinel-1 data, on SAR data, on this particular type of SAR data before you can um, use it for your uh, final analysis. Of course, uh, of course, these steps differ depending on the analysis you're performing, but in this case, um, we have several steps that we need to perform. So since it would be quite time consuming to do each step one by one on each of the images, we will actually use a very handy tool in SNAP, which is called batch processing, which you can find here in tools batch processing, but the input to batch processing is the graph of the process. So first we need to actually build our processing chain that includes all of the processing steps, steps that we wish to perform, or not all of them, but all that we wish to perform in this step. And then we can run this on both of our images. So first when I open the graph builder, you can see that I can only have, uh, or I only have two operators, the uh, read operator and the write operator, and I have also a tab corresponding to each of them at the bottom of the window, and here I can set my parameters. So the first thing that we need to do when we start using Sentinel-1 data for majority, for absolute majority of applications is update the orbit files. So the orbit file vectors, are basically the orbit vectors, sorry, orbit state vectors are provided in the metadata of the SAR product and they are generally not very accurate. So there is precise orbit files that are made available within days to weeks after the generation of the product and if you are processing the data, SNAP can automatically uh, download these, met these updated orbit metadata and update the metadata available in the product as you have downloaded it. So we can first input this one operator and we can find it if you go to radar, if you right click, you go to add radar and apply orbit file and here we go. So we, here we have the apply orbit file operator and we can move on. So next we can add um, the thermal noise removal operator again and we'll right click, go to radar, go to radiometric and thermal noise removal. So what is the thermal noise removal? Basically, uh, thermal noise, noise in SAR imagery is the background energy that is generated by a receiver uh, itself. So, and it skews the radar reflectivity towards higher values and it hampers the precision of radar reflectivity estimates. I apologize for my pronunciation. So in the level one product that we are using now, um, in the metadata there is a, a lookup table that's provided uh, with measurement uh, for each data set uh, and we can use this lookup table to update uh, or to correct for the for the um, thermal noise. Then the next step is going to be calibration. So again we can go to radar, radiometric and calibration. And calibration basically in this step um, a typical SAR data processing which produces the level one images that we are now using, does not actually include the radiometric corrections and significant radiometric bias is still present in the data. And the radiometric correction is necessary for pixel values to truly represent the, background, the radar backscatter of the reflecting surface. So if we wish to perform some comparison between SAR images acquired with different sensors or acquired at the same, with the same sensor but at different times, different modes or processed by different processors, we generally always need to apply um, the calibration to avoid uh, large uh, errors. So uh, now we need to connect our graph, so you can just right click and click connect graph. And now we have our graph uh, created. And at the moment, here you can change all the parameters, but we will not do that. We will actually change the parameters in the batch processing um, menu. So here we can now save the graph, just click on save and save the data somewhere, the graph, my graph, for example. And I can close the dialog 
And now I can go to the batch processing. And here I have one tab that um, says um, input output parameters. And I can use this icon here to load all the um, open products that I have in Snap, which is of course the two. And then I can click on refresh just to load uh, the parameters of the, each of the products so I can see what type uh, it is, when the date of the acquisition, um, the relative orbit track, and so on. And then here I can choose um, which directory is the output directory where I wish to save my, uh, my outputs. And here, this is quite important, um, this is uh, an option that you can use to keep the source product name for your output name, for your output product. Uh, this is important in case you are, um, for example, saving the product in the same folder that you have your input products. If you have, if you do that, then your input products will be overwritten because it keeps the same name. So, but for our case, we are saving them in a different folder so I can leave this uh, selected. And I can load my graph that I just created. So, it's my graph. There we go. And I have all my tabs available here. So, I apply orbit file. Here, um, we can finally set the parameters. So, Actually, here I will not change anything. I will just delete the default options. Um, you can choose here basically from a few different orbit files that are available online. We will use the precise ones. Um, the restituted orbits are generally a little bit less precise than the precise ones, uh, but they are available sooner. But since our acquisitions are more than a year ago, um, already the precise orbits are, of course, available. Then we will um, leave everything else by default and go to thermal noise. So in the thermal noise um, menu, we again don't really have to change anything. We can select here um, polarization, which we want to process further. In our case, we will only be using HH polarization, so I can click on it. And in this case, only the HH will be processed any further. And here I have two options to remove and we introduce thermal noise. Of course, we want to use the remove option. There might be some rare cases in which you which want to use the introduce thermal noise option, but not for us. And then we have the calibration. You can see that I only see the HH polarization here available because I limited um, this in the previous operator. And I have, again, three options. We will here use the sigma naught, which is the Backscatter, uh, radar backscatter coefficient, which we will be using. And then we could click Run. Uh, this will take a couple of minutes, so I will not actually run the process as I have the data pre-processed for, uh, for this purpose. Um, so I will just close the dialog and open the pre-processed products. However, um, yeah, you would just click Run and then you would see how long uh, it would probably take around two minutes or so. Close. And let me open There we go. So once it would be processed, this is exactly how my uh, my snap would look. I would have additional two products that were created here. They would have the same names because remember I kept the keep product name uh, option. But if I open the bands, I can see that I only have a single band here, which is the sigma naught HH. So let's just simply open it. It actually does not visually look much different from our original data. Um, but we can use it uh, for our further processing. So in the next step, we need to register uh, our data and apply the offset tracking method. So again, we will build a graph to do this, but now we will only use the graph builder to basically uh, build the graph and apply it because we will um, input both of our products. So let's do that. So we have one read operator here. And we will add another one, so read two, to read both of our products. And then we will use the DEM assisted co-registration, which is in radar co-registration and DEM assisted co-registration. And connect both of these to our co-registration. So image co-registration is basically a process of geometrically aligning two or more images so that corresponding pixels represent identical area on the Earth's surface. This is why we are trying to do this. Um, and it is possible to register two or more um, 
products using only orbit state vectors that we updated in the previous step. However, for the purpose of offset tracking, we need more precise co-registration. So we are using this DEM-assisted co-registration, which also, as the name suggests, uses a digital elevation model to help improve the co-registration accuracy. So in the next step, we will use a subset. So we are not really interested in the full extent of our image, and it also increases the processing time. So here we can go to raster and geometric and subset to have the subset operator. I will set all the parameters of uh, later here below. But now I will just input all the uh, processing steps. So um, the next step that we need to do is the offset tracking. and it will be available in radar, SAR applications, and offset tracking. I will explain a bit more about offset tracking once we are setting the parameters. And to finish the graph, we will add one more write operator. Write two. And then we will connect our subset to the offset tracking operator, and that one to the second write operator. And then we will also connect our subset to the write. So this is due to the fact that um, we actually want a product that contains all of the bands. So it contains the original two sigma naught bands, but also the result of the offset tracking. And the result of offset tracking contains uh, a vector file that contains all the ground control points with um, their location in the first image and in the second image and uh, estimated velocity between the two uh, positions. And um, since we wish to re retain this, we cannot use the band merge operator here because during that, that would be lost. So we are actually going to stack the uh, two products later, but in this case, we now uh, export the offset tracking separately and also the original uh, data subsetted and co-registered. Okay. So again, um, let's go through the parameters. So in the first read parameter, we would set our product number three, which is the first pre-processed product from the uh, 9th of uh, September. In the read two, we would choose the product number four, which is the one from the 21st of September. And then we can go to the DEM assisted co-registration. Here we can leave all the defaults. Uh, we just need to change here the digital elevation model. You can see that it's actually um, screaming at me here in the red letters, uh, telling me that the entire image is outside of the SRTM valid area. So a snap tends to automatically use SRTM three-second resolution. Unfortunately, SRTM is not available in uh, such high altitudes. Uh, sorry, latitudes, not altitudes. So we need to use a different digital elevation model. In our case, we will just use the asset 30. They are uh, automatically downloaded by SNAP, so you don't need to uh, have them stored on your computer or pre-download them in any way, uh, at least for the ones that um, specify auto-download. For the ones that do not, like a STAR-TM one-second grid, you have to download them first and put them in a specific location in um, the SNAP home folder. But for us, we will just use the auto-download one. And um, then you have two more parameters here to set, which is the DEM resampling method, um, the resampling method of the image and tile extension, and whether to mask out areas with no elevation. We can uh, leave this. The area with no elevation, of course, in this case would be uh, the sea surface, but um, we can see, leave this option. And we will also leave all the defaults for the other settings. Then we can go to the subset. So here in the subset operator, you have two options on how to proceed with the subset. You can use uh, pixel coordinates or geographic coordinates. For our case, we will use pixel coordinates because we only have, a, at this point, once we've performed the um, assisted co-registration, we only have one product that's resampled to the exactly same um, exactly same uh, grid. So if we wish to do a subset, we can use um, the pixel coordinates as they will be we don't need to compare multiple different products. However, if you have multiple different products that are not 
for example, to the same grid, um, such as, for example, if you use multiple Sentinel-1 products that are not uh, georeferenced and you wish to have the same exact area, I would advise you to always use the geographic coordinates, which are um, given as a well-known text format uh, polygon, uh, and you can vis visualize it on the map here, uh, which are um, absolute geographic coordinates as compared to the relative pixel coordinates that do not correspond to any physical spatial or in, uh, to any physical geographic coordinates. So now I will just fill in um, the coordinates that we want to use. That of course always depends on your um, area of interest. So for us, we'll uh, minimize the, well, make the image a little bit smaller. And then we can move on to uh, the offset tracking. So now you can see that I have two bands here, one corresponding to the, um, the basically the master image, so the first acquisition, which is on the 9th of September, and the one on the 21st of September. And we will now use these two um, to perform the offset tracking. Um, so offset tracking basically is a method that is used to estimate motion of a feature between two acquisitions through cross-correlation on uh, selected ground control points in registered images. So we have the master and the slave images. Um, and um, the movement uh, velocity is then computed based on the offsets estimated by the cross-correlation. And the velocities are computed, or the velocities computed on the GCP or ground control point grid are interpolated to create a velocity map. Uh, this method is very, very commonly used for glacier motion, motion estimation. And we need to fill in a few parameters to perform it. So first we have this uh, output grid. So it's this um, ground control point grid that I was mentioning before. We have at the moment 40 pixel spacing, which corresponds to 400 meters. We will increase this to 60 in this case. So this is basically, we have both options. We have the azimuth and range spacing uh, directions. So and um, as I said, we will send it, send it to six, 60 pixels or 600 meters in both directions. And this is sort of a balance between the level of detail and the smoothness of our um, output product. And 600 meters is sufficient for us. Um, it is always a trade-off between, as I said, the smoothness and the level of detail. So it very much depends on um, the level of detail that you're trying to achieve. However, with more uh, detail, you will also get more uh, outliers and more originally um, estimated velocities. The next thing that we need to set um, is the registration window dimensions, which is right here. And the size of the registration uh, window depends on the maximum velocity of the glacier, which you should generally find out prior to any uh, processing from literature or historical data and the period between the data acquisitions. So in our case, this is a 12 days. Uh, and the maximum speed of the Peterman Glacier uh, is approximately five meters per day. And this means that the glacier surface will shift by a maximum 60 meters between the two acquisitions. In this case, we have it uh, set to 180, uh, sorry, 128 pixels, which corresponds to uh, 1,280 meters which more than generously covers um, this uh, 60 meters shift that we expect during the 12 days. And um, the last setting that we will use is here, the maximum velocity. So I've mentioned already that for Peterman Glacier, this is approximately five uh, meters per day. And we set this here in order to um, filter out false high values um, and basically um, limit the outliers. And just to explain how the processing of the offset tracking is performed, so for each point in the user-specified um, GCP grid in the master image, um, the operator will compute a corresponding pixel position in the slave image using normalized correlation. And if the computed offset between uh, the master and slave um, G 
GCP positions exceeds a maximum offset computed from the user specified maximum velocity, then the GCP point is marked as an outlier. And then we perform a local average of the offset on valid uh, GCP points, so not classified as outliers, and we fill the holes caused by uh, the outliers. And basically we fill the holes by computing um, local weighted average uh, for the missing points. And then we compute velocities for all points uh, from the GCP grid, from their offsets, and finally um, for all the pixels in the master image uh, from the velocities on the GCP points that we interpolate the, uh, the velocity for each pixel in the, in the input image. Okay, so um, I hope uh, this was uh, coherent and then we can uh, write uh, the outputs. So for the first um, output we will, uh, for the offset tracking output we will use the write to operator here. So we can save it um, just to, to, we can leave this, uh, the default name here, so you can see that the processor always attaches a name to the end. So we have a stack which is created by this and then velocity which is created by the offset operator. And then we have the other write operator here which is writing our subsetted product um, which we have in the beginning here. Because the uh, order of the operators down here is in the order of adding them, so we originally had one read and right operator, so that's why they are in the beginning. And we can see that here we have no velocity, we just have the stack, uh, which is okay. So we can now click run. Again, this process is very, very um, computationally heavy. So it would take approximately 20 minutes for the data that I have here with the computer that I have. Um, so in this case, uh, if you are rerunning this webinar on a computer that does not have 32 gigabytes of RAM, um, you have to uh, be patient because this is going to take a long time to process due to the um, cross-correlation uh, steps uh, and the co-registration as well. So uh, we would click run, but in my case I will just close. You can also save the graph uh, prior to running it uh, or after running it to be used for for your future studies, as you can of course always change the parameters um, and apply this to a different study area. So I will now close and just open the pre-processed data. There we go. So once my processing has finished, I have two new products here. So they're as an index 5 and 6, velocity and the simple stack here and the velocity. So now um, we can just uh, have a look at the velocity product. So if I uh, open it, you can see the ground control point grid um, overlaying the, uh, the image. And the ground control point grid is um, saved here in the vector data point. So this is the ground control points, but it's actually this one, the one called velocity, because for each of these points we also have the offset and uh, estimated velocity. So now I can actually turn it off just to have a little bit better visualization. So I can do that in layer manager here. I can see the product structure and I can go to vector data and deselect velocity. And now I can have uh, a better look on my, um, on my estimated velocity. And I can go to color manipulation just to see my maximum and minimum values. So I can see that I have some outlying values that are um, a minimum here of 0 0.23. And then I have um, some, the maximum values that I detected in this acquisitions are approximately 4 meters per day, corresponding to the red values here in the, um, in the floating. So, now, the next step, what we want to do is we want to actually stack the products. So we want to add these bands into our product here. So we have one overall product that uh, contains the velocity band, the velocity uh, vector, and also the, um, the two original sigma not HH bands here. Um, we can do this uh, many different ways, but in order to um, keep our velocity vector and not um, so it does not disappear. We will actually use the uh, band math. So if you right click on the product here, you can take the first uh, option. 
and it's event mark. And here we can change the name to sigma naught HH. So it's this similar name as here, just to keep track. And um, I want to deselect the virtual option here because if I choose the virtual, it will not save the data physically um, in my um, in my data set. Uh, it will always be calculated on fly, which for what I'm attempting to do now, it would not be possible because I'm using I would be using data from a different product. So and then I go to edit expression and as I said I will be using data from different products so I can have to change the source of the data sources here to the second product which is the number six. This only works for products that have the same exact grid and the same exact extent and so on. Only in those you can use bands from different products to calculate an output. In this case we will use the first band of the 9th of September because that's what the name we selected here. And we can see that the software can find it. It tells us there's no errors and we can click OK. OK again. And I can see now that this band has been added to my uh, velocity product. Again, it always gets overlaid by the vector. We can turn it off, but in this case, I will not uh, do this now. And I will add the second band as well. So I will go again to band math. Here we go. I will again deselect virtual, edit expression, again change my product from my uh, product 5 to product 6, and choose the second band of product 6. Okay, and now I have one uh, product here, which contains my input data, my velocity data, as well as my velocity vector. So this is the one that I will use for any further processing. And the next step that we need to apply is uh, the terrain correction. So why the terrain correction? Our data are in, still in radar geometry. You can see that they're still flipped. Um, but more, moreover, um, due to topographical variations of the scene um, and the tilt of the satellite sensor, distances can be distorted in the SAR images. And we need to apply terrain correction to compensate for these distortions and project the scene to geographic projection. So we can do this by going to radar, geometric, terrain correction, sorry, terrain correction, and we choose the range Doppler terrain correction. And we can here choose our input product, which is the number five, so the one that contains all our bands and as well as vectors. We choose the output name and we choose uh, the processing parameters. So here we can see we have all three bands available here. We also use the digital elevation mode to, to correct for the terrain um, distortions. Again, again here, SNAP chooses automatically the SRTM, but that would of course not work, as I said before. So again, we will use the ASE 30. Um, then um, in the rest of the parameters, we don't have to change, we have options Again, to, uh, for a DM resampling method, an image resampling method, we will leave them as they are. And you have also an option here for pixel spacing. So if you wish to change from 10 meters as it is now to, for example, 100, you can also do that to reduce the resolution of the image. Um, and the last thing we can set is the map projection. So in our case, we will use uh, the... Uh, UTM uh, World Geodetic System uh, from 1984 and we will use the automatic option which automatically determines the zone of the UTM based on the location of our data. So in this case it chooses the zone 21 and then we have also the options here, the mass gap areas with elevation, that's basically what we've already performed and um, you can also choose what other bands should be output uh, in your should be present in your output um, in our case we just uh, choose the selected source bands we don't wish to add any other ones but you can add the uh, digital elevation model latitude longitude incidence angle and so on and then again once we have all our parameters set i would click run Again, this would take approximately two minutes, not very long if you're doing it on your own, but for our webinar purposes, not really what we want to do. Um, so 
I will close and I will again load um, the preloaded session or the pre-processed uh, images. So I'm using these session files. Um, these basically can save um, image of the products opened in your snap. So it uh, is sort of like uh, if you're experienced with QGIS, uh, like uh, the project in QGIS, it does not unfortunately save any visualizations or opened uh, views. It only saves the loaded products. So if you, for example, know that uh, you need to open the same products every time um, to perform different things, you can use this. Uh, sorry, I click on the wrong. Let me reopen this. Okay, there we go. So, sorry for that. Um, I clicked on the wrong option. But, um, okay, so uh, I closed actually the four, two original products and the two pre-processed products. So, what we are left with is products five, six, and seven. And the seven being the one that we have now just processed and applied the terrain correction to. So, it has the suffix terrain correction. And if I go to the bands, I can see all my three bands. And in vector uh, data, I can see the velocity band that is important. Um, and now let's open just the velocity really quick. Or let's open actually the sigma naught HH band. So you can see that it's now uh, the image is shifted. The product is uh, projected into UTM. We can close again the velocity vector because that's what's making a little bit of mess here. And now actually finally our image is oriented correctly. If I look at... Uh, the map, so it approximately somewhere here, facing sort of northwest. Um, and we can now um, play with the visualizations. So what I could do now is to load uh, the velocity map over my original data. So I can use this, um, sorry, uh, let me explain. So you can you go to the layer manager and you can use this plus sign to add an image band or type one grid. And in this case, it gives you the option to choose from the other bands present in the product. So I can choose the velocity here and click Finish. And it will overlay the bands on top of each other. Sorry, sometimes you have to move around the image a little bit for it uh, in order for it to be loaded completely to snap. Oh, now I lost the top again. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. So I can actually go to navigation here and click on zoom. Snap generally loads products in tiles and sometimes uh, if it's a big product like this, um, it does not like it so much. So it may create some problems. Okay, so now we finally have our product. Uh, and we can see that um, the visualization that is applied to the velocity layer um, basically gives to zero values um, total transparency. So I actually see the higher values corresponding exactly to the uh, to the glacier to or to the shelf and to the to the highest flow um, area, the area with the hi um, highest velocities or highest movement. Uh, and also of the tributaries uh, to the side here. And this is basically one way how you can visualize uh, the data. You can overlay them also over Sentinel-2 data, for example, for optical and so on. Um, Snap, of course, is not an ideal tool to visualize your data. It's not made for that. It's made more for processing. So if you wish to export the data and visualize them in a different software, um, such as QGIS, RTIS, or any other one, you can do that. You can, uh, at the moment, we have the data saved in a DIMM format, which is a native format of Snap. But you can always export your data into any other formats, like, such as, for example, if I click on the product here, so I have to always export the full product, so I click on, um, on the one here, and I go to export, and I can choose from a like, high number of uh, products that I could use, like such as the geotech. So if I click on it, I can also subset my data 
uh, also produce band subsets. So if I don't want all of the bands and so on, I can do spatial subset and many others. Um, these steps I will not show here, um, but it's just for you to know that, of course, SNAP is not ideal for visualization. Um, so you can um, transfer your data easily to a different software. So now the last thing that we will do during the training is to see actually, so how good is our estimate of the velocity? How well does the offset tracking on these two um, images perform compared to uh, other data sources that are out there? Um, so we have, I prepared a file um, that contains data from two sources. One of them is the uh, data from the Center of, for Polar Observation and Modeling Data Portal. Um, and um, these are near real-time velocity maps produced uh, by offset tracking as well in Sentinel-1 images between two consecutive acquisitions. In this case, this means um, acquisitions of both uh, Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B. So with the uh, period between the acquisitions used for the offset tracking is uh, six days. And the data that I will be using here are from the exactly the same period as our um, input images, but they are from the 15th to 21st of September of 2017, whereas our results correspond to 19th to 21st. So, um, and the second data set um, contains uh, values extracted from the NVO Greenland uh, ice velocity map from 2016 to 2017. Uh, those are derived also using feature tracking in Sentinel-1, uh, but compared to the previous data set, the NVO velocity values, um, or the NVO velocity uses 12-day periods between the images, the same as our product. But the final product is generated by pixel scale averaging of velocities estimated from image pairs acquired between 23rd of December 2016 and 22nd of February 2017. So they do not correspond exactly to the same period that we have here. And they are resampled to um, 250 uh, meter grid. Okay, so uh, how can we do this? How can we compare our values? So I prepared this file that is a CSV file. Um, that we can load into SNAP. So click on vector, import, and vector from CSV. And let's see here, bitumen glacier velocity. And here, the first thing, so basically it's a table that has location of the points and the parameters corresponding to them, such as the values of the, or the velocity, uh, velocities for each of the data sets. Um, I will use, uh, again, predefined uh, CSR, so I need to apply, um, uh, sorry, CRS, uh, I need to apply a specific, uh, I need to tell the software which projection uh, my data are in. So in this case, it's in uh, VGS lat long, which has the APSG code of uh, 4326. So it's the general lat long projection uh, based on World Geodetic System uh, from 1984. And I click OK. Okay, and now it asks me how do I want to import uh, the point data, how I want to interpret them. So I can leave them unchanged, which will mean that it imports a point data set. I can interpret each point as a vertex um, of a single line, or I can import uh, each um, point as a track point, uh, which is the option that we will select. And there we go. So here we have our track points that are uh, corresponding to the um, flow of the of the glacier, or it's a basically flow profile uh, along the along the flow direction of the glacier. Sorry, and um, we can now compare with our data set. So we can for the comparison we can use this uh, profile tool here, and I click on the profile plot. Sorry, first I actually need to click here on the velocity band in order to tell the profile plot which is the input data that I want to use. And then I also want to use um, region of interest, which in this case will be uh, not the velocity, but the Peterman Glacier velocity points, which I just imported. So it will use the same exact points as in my uh, comparison data set. And I want to use a correlative data, again, from the same data set. And I want to compare them with the uh, 
first with the CPOM velocities of six days. So now I will deselect this, which will give me, uh, I don't want to compute the in-between points. And we can see these are the two data sets compared. The blue one corresponds to the one that we just derived. It's a little bit smoother because um, the values for the pixels are interpolated between uh, GCP points that are further apart, so 600 meters as compared to the CPOM values, which are, I believe, 100 meters, but I don't, don't, now don't want to um, be wrong. And also, uh, the variability, higher variab variability in the CPOM data set can be caused by the fact that we have a shorter um, period between the acquisitions. So this is, uh, but otherwise, actually, so there is much higher variability in the CPOM data set than in our data, but otherwise, um, they correspond quite well to one another. Now let's have a look to, con to compare with the NVO data set, which we can select here. Now we can see that they correspond very well, even though they correspond to different time periods. So our data are from, um, from um, uh, September 2017, whereas the red data set, the NVO data set is from uh, the winter of 2016 to 2017. But you can see that the velocities are really uh, very, very similar. So our method seems to work very well for the estimation. Um, it's relatively simple and you can basically now to take the data and uh, further process them, create maps and so on and so on. So this is where I will uh, end. You can, uh, of course, do many other steps and visualizing in the data and the QGIS and so on. There is some steps that are outlined in the in the step-by-step -step guide that is available if you register for the virtual machine and you uh, re request this uh, training kit. You will also receive the step-by-step -step guide which contains some additional steps of how to visualize the data in QGIS with um, um, arrows and so on. So um, this is uh, the end of the exercise. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention and we will close this webinar. Thank you very much. And uh, have a nice afternoon.